for a reading from some excerpts from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said to them, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. If anyone eat this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews on that account argued with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus therefore said to them, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. Many of his disciples, therefore, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were murmuring at this, said to them, Does this scandalize you? The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some among you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who it was who would betray him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. Jesus therefore said to the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter therefore answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast words of everlasting life, and we have come to believe and to know that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. Now, he was speaking of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was, the one of the twelve, who would betray him. So far, the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the year 1794, It was July the 17th to be exact, but on July the 17th, 1794, there were some women who were in Paris, France, and they were singing, singing. Now, at first glance, that might not seem too unusual. I mean, in the 1700s, There must have been any number of women in France at that time that might have been singing at any particular time. But these women were a little bit different because these women were all brides of Christ. They were Catholic Carmelite nuns, in fact, and they were singing the Psalms and various canticles. They sang the Te Deum, the Salve Regina, and the Laudate Dominum on this giant is praise the Lord, all you nations. All in Latin, all beautifully clear and bright and joyful. Well, what made this quite unusual in the France of 1794, however, was that although these nuns were all indeed singing, yes, and singing in the most beautiful way, Nevertheless, they were singing and chanting that way while they were on their way to their martyrdom, their sentence of death at the guillotine. The guillotine, sharp knife on the scaffold, set up right in the middle of the city of Paris, set up in that place of execution to deal with all the so-called enemies of the state and the so-called enemies of the people. Sixteen Carmelite nuns, to be exact, in full religious habit and Carmelite cape, just singing, singing all the way to their death, condemned to death specifically because of their fidelity to the Roman Catholic faith and to the religious vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And the crowd which normally surrounded such a place as the guillotine was almost always a heartless group of people, noisy and mocking, insulting group. But on this day, dead silence fell on that crowd. It was almost as if you could have heard a pin drop. The youngest nun, they say, went first. She went up to the Mother Superior, Blessed Teresa of St. Augustine. Permission to die, Mother. Yes, go, my daughter. The youngest first and then the rest in proper order, all singing. 
And they say that that first young nun who went up, she offered her life as a sacrifice for Christ, appeared as beautiful as a bride on her wedding day, prepared for her bridegroom. And she went singing, and then her voice was stilled. And one by one, the others followed, singing, singing, each in her proper order. First 16, then 15, then 14. As each sister offered her sacrifice, her voice was stilled. And yet those who remained, the rest, they all continued to chant until there were four, three, two, until only one voice remained, a phrase ringing out in the beautiful Parisian air, the Mother Superior, Blessed Teresa of St. Augustine, expressing everything that was in her heart in sacred song. And then the guillotine then went up and down one last time, and so there was silence. Profound silence. Yes, her voice was silenced on this earth, but now she and all of her daughters continue to sing. Singing forever at the eternal wedding feast of the Lamb, those 16 Carmelite nuns had offered their lives deliberately and secretly. Nobody knew about it. They had offered their lives in a vow. They offered each of their lives individually, yes, but also as a community. They made a community offering to our Lord Jesus Christ. They deliberately offered their lives as a sacrifice to Jesus Christ himself, that is, if he so willed to accept it, such that if he did indeed find them worthy, then they were willing to offer our Lord a trade. They offered to trade their lives and their life's blood in exchange for the end of the terror and the end of the French Revolution in France and for an end to the persecution of the Catholic Church in that land so that the Catholic faith could be reborn again in France. And Almighty God heard that prayer. Because ten days later, the conclusion of the space of a simple novena, on the tenth day after their sacrifice, their martyrdom, the terror in France was brought to a sudden halt. Immediately. And nobody had expected it. Nobody had predicted it. The guillotine ceased its work of death, and the Catholic Church was given some time to regroup and to reform. And so at least for a time, that's exactly what happened in France, at least for a time. Many new religious orders of holy men and women sprang up in France at that time. And just one of the many religious institutes, and there are many famous ones that come out of the French Revolution. But one of those institutes, which were the fruit of that renewal in France after the sacrifice of the Carmelite nuns, is my own religious community. The priest of mercy of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Fathers of Mercy, founded after that in 1808 in France. And many more to this very day. So the Fathers of Mercy and many other new religious communities were born, you might say, were the fruit of the passion of the church in France. During the revolution of 1789, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And the church does somehow mirror and reflect in her own way the very life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sixteen Carmelite nuns who sang at the scaffold and offered their lives in reparation for sin are just another perfect example of the way that the passion of Christ manifests itself from age to age in the church. 
Yesterday we saw how the passion of the church was manifested in England, beginning at the time of King Henry VIII. And we saw how it is often the increase of sins. Sins committed. Sins committed primarily by bad Catholics. Which brings on the intensity of the suffering which marks the church's passion in time. And we also noted that the very specific sins that tend to be the most destructive are sins against the faith itself. Unbelief and heresy, apostasy. And that the reason why they are so destructive is because they always plunge the soul into spiritual darkness and spiritual blindness. With these sins, the mind is especially darkened. Sins against the faith because the Catholic faith is the truth. The mind absorbs truth. The Catholic faith is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if one will not believe the truth, then he must believe a lie. So the soul moves from spiritual light into spiritual darkness. So tonight, let's go ahead and apply a little deeper these insights that we've gotten from this paradigm of the passion of the church. Because if we get right down to it, the life of the church has many almost exact parallels in history. The very life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the popes have taught this. Pope Pius XI, remember 1928, quote, The expiatory passion of Christ is renewed and in a manner continued and fulfilled in his mystical body, which is the church. Rightly, therefore, does Christ, still suffering in his mystical body, desire to have us partakers of his expiation. And this is also demanded by our intimate union with him. For since we are the body of Christ and members of member, whatever the head suffers, all the members must suffer with it. This is common teaching. And from the Catholic Catechism, quote, the church's ultimate trial. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. Sound familiar? The church will enter the glory of the kingdom only through this final Passover when she will follow her Lord in his death and resurrection. Close quote. There's a mirror reflecting the life of Christ and life of the church. So it will be good here to ask this question tonight. If Jesus Christ himself was betrayed... And if the Roman Catholic Church does indeed from time to time mystically reflect and mirror that same betrayal in history in various ways, then what is the common instrument that perpetrates such shameful deeds? Well, sacred scripture specifically tells us who does it and how it comes about and what the circumstances are and the settings and the situations in which these kinds of betrayals take place. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, for example, when our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching the people about the future mystical sacrifice, the Mass, which he will establish and how that sacrifice will yield his real sacramental presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity, under the appearances, the species of bread and wine. After that discourse, St. John's Gospel, chapter 6, where our Lord makes it crystal clear that in order to maintain the supernatural life of grace, one must not only believe literally his Eucharistic doctrine, but must also partake of that sacrament by receiving that blessed host of spiritual food. But that passage wherein our Lord said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. 
At the conclusion of that sacramental discourse, we discover that one of the apostles, evidently, on the inside, secretly, in his heart, one of the apostles seems to have refused to believe those words in the doctrine of our Lord. So that disciple, we find, is the one who will indeed betray our Lord. And specifically note here that in the Gospels, over and over again, when that particular one who will betray is mentioned, he's mentioned quite often in the context of some key teaching concerning the holy sacrifice of the Mass and holy communion. Quote, this is Gospel of St. John. Jesus therefore said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. Many of his disciples, therefore, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were murmuring at this, said to them, Does this scandalize you? The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some among you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. He already knew. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. Jesus therefore said to the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter therefore answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast words of everlasting life, and we've come to believe and to know that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Now here is the last sentence. Gospel of John, chapter 6. It's the very last sentence in the chapter. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. Now, he was speaking of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was, the one of the twelve, who would betray him, close quote. Right there in the Eucharistic discourse. So perhaps, maybe, we should rethink a little bit, perhaps, some of our regular preconceived notions about Judas Iscariot. Because don't we often think of him as betraying our Lord mostly because he was greedy? Or because he loved money or something like that. Of course he was greedy. But notice, before the gospel speak about his greed, which he really did have, nevertheless his disbelief in the doctrine of our Lord's real presence in the most blessed sacrament preceded any reference to the greed of Judas. Quote, here's our Lord. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some among you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Some among you do not believe. So what do we have here with Judas? Well, in the first place we have... In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, a direct connection between unbelief and one of the essential doctrinal teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the essential truths of our faith. We have a direct connection between the doctrinal teaching of Jesus and betrayal, especially that of Judas. Let's hear it once more. Our Lord said, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some among you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him, close quote. Unbelief here, and especially in the truths concerning the most blessed sacrament of the altar and the holy sacrifice of the Mass, That unbelief yields betrayal. And a betrayer, and his name is Judas. So let's go a little further. For we mentioned last night that supernatural grace carries with it 
a kind of a spiritual light, especially the light of faith. But denial of the truths of faith, that is unbelief, denial of the truths of the faith yields darkness, spiritual darkness, spiritual blindness. So on the night on which our Lord was betrayed at the Last Supper, sacred scripture says Judas went out and that it was night. It was dark from the Gospel of St. John. When Jesus had said these things, this was at the Last Supper, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and he testified and said, Amen, Amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples, therefore, looked one upon another, doubting of whom he spoke. Now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him and said to him, Who is it of whom he speaks? He, therefore, leaning on the breast of Jesus, saith to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall reach bread dipped. And when he had dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, That which thou doest, do quickly. He, therefore, having received the morsel, went out immediately, and it was night. So Judas went out. And it was night. That means that it was dark. That means that there was no light. Remember what we said yesterday about spiritual light and spiritual darkness? It's real. And how certain kinds of sins cause certain kinds of shadows and dark stains on the soul. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that sins against the faith, like denying the Holy Eucharist, cause the total loss of supernatural faith and a darkening of the mind. Now, this is from the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas, Doctor of the Church, quote, When man sins, he cleaves to certain things against the light of reason. Wherefore, the loss of beauty occasioned by that contact is metaphorically called a stain on the soul. The stain denotes a privation of the soul's brightness. That's light. Wherefore, diverse sins occasion diverse stains. So this kind of sin will cause this kind of stain. This kind of sin will cause this kind of stain. It's like a shadow, which is the privation of light. Close quote. And in another place, Summa Theologica, St. Thomas Aquinas, quote, Grace is a light of the soul. Hence, Augustine says, The light of truth rightly deserts the prevaricator of the law. That's the disobedient and the sinner. The light of truth rightly deserts the prevaricator of the law, and those who have been thus deserted become blind, close quote. So let's make an observation here. Some sins, while not directly affecting the mind per se, some sins, while not directly affecting the mind, just seem to make the soul black and ugly. Sins of the flesh against the sixth and the ninth commandment. Sins of greed and so on. Now, Sins against the truth, sins against the faith, do that too. But also darken and blacken the mind itself, the intellect, so that one cannot see supernatural truth. That's why our Lord called the scribes and the Pharisees blind. Blind Pharisees, blind guides, they couldn't see the truth. Remember in your catechism, what's Father always taught you about charity? He says you can commit mortal sins like sins of the flesh and sins against charity and sins of greed and so on and so forth. But faith can still stay. 
If you haven't sinned against the faith. That's why the Catholic is still required on Sunday to come to Mass even if they can't go to Holy Communion. Because they still have the faith. And because they have the faith, they're able to see that they're in the wrong. And that's why since they can see the truth, then they can get into that confessional and get those sins forgiven and come back to charity. Does that make sense? But it does indeed happen to any Catholic who stubbornly and deliberately denies one or more of the essential articles of the faith. Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, magisterial teaching and so on. That kind of denial, says St. Thomas Aquinas, yields a total loss of supernatural faith. Quote, here's from the Summa. Apostasy pertains to unbelief. Since faith is the first foundation of things to be hoped for, the truth, and since without faith it is impossible to please God, when once faith is removed, man retains nothing that may be useful for obtaining eternal salvation. For which reason it is written, a man that is an apostate and unprofitable man. Because faith is the life of the soul, according to Romans, the just man lives by faith. Therefore, just as when the life of the body is taken away, man's every member and part loses its due disposition. So when the life of justice, which is by faith, is done away, disorder appears in all of the members. Apostasy. According to Second Peter, it had been better for them not to have known the truth than after they had known it to have turned back. That's apostasy, close quote. So if we have ears to hear and a mind to understand, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, then we should be able to see now why so many of our priests and nuns in these last 30 years seem to be almost totally incapable of teaching the complete Roman Catholic faith in our time. And why? Because if anyone tries to pick and choose which essential truths that they want to accept and those that they do not want to accept, then they will always fall into spiritual blindness and fundamental unbelief because it is all or nothing. They have no supernatural faith and they follow the same path originally traced out by Judas Iscariot who went out in unbelief from the first Mass at the Last Supper and immediately found out that it was night. It was dark, and he could not see, and he ultimately discovered that Satan had entered into him at night. Father John A. Harden, S.J., a good Jesuit, God rest his soul, He had already made the connection between the passion of Christ and the passion of the church these days by pointing out the real imitators of Judas that we find today. Father Hardin, he had over 50 years in the priesthood. Quote, this is not me, this is Father Hardin. Satan entered the heart of Judas. Father Hardin. Judas was possessed by the same devil who tempted Christ at the beginning of his public ministry but failed. Very well, very well, said the devil to himself. I've not been able to break down Jesus' strength of will. I'll do the next best thing. I will cause his death and cause his death through the betrayal of one of his chosen followers. Now, here's Father Hardin. The best part about Father Hardin was what he always said afterwards. How we need. How we need to hear this today and how we should pray with all the earnestness of our hearts for strength and courage for the chosen followers of Christ, especially the bishops, especially the priests, and especially the religious chosen by and consecrated to the heart of Christ that they... And then he said, let me change the pronoun that we might not betray Jesus Christ. And if there is one class of person that the devil specializes in using, it is particularly those who were specially called by Jesus to follow him and the worst agony of the mystical body of Christ. 
has been the result of the betrayal of those whom Christ had chosen to be his most intimate companions and followers, close quote. For the John A. Harden, God rest his soul over 50 years in the priesthood, and he saw many, many things in that 50 years. But in the 10 short years of my priesthood, I myself have seen enough sacrilege to test the faith of even the most devout traditional Catholic. It is not my goal, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to scandalize any of you this night. But it would be very easy for me to do so. No problem. I was three years on the parish mission band going from one end of this nation to the other. And I've been there and I've done that. And I've seen these things and I don't want to see them anymore. And I'm not going to scandalize you tonight. But on the positive side, let's just suffice it to say that the reintroduction of the traditional mass, the Tridentine mass, serves to immediately root out most of those abuses and unholy situations and sacrileges which I saw. Because the traditional mass is deliberately surrounded by strict rules and safeguards for the most blessed sacrament. The priest is not allowed to do such and such a thing because it's forbidden. Safeguard the holy mass. The laity are not allowed to do such and such a thing because it's forbidden. Safeguard of the mass and the most blessed sacrament in the rubrics. But here the question very naturally needs to be asked. So how in the world did we get in this situation in the first place? The short answer is sin. Who sin? Well, everybody sin, really. But since you don't need to hear what I have to say, who cares what I have to say on the matter? Let's listen to our blessed mother, our blessed lady. I think she knows what to say. And at La Salette and at Our Lady of Good Success, two church-approved apparitions, she was very clear. La Salette, and this was in 1846, quote, The priest ministers of my son will fall into impurity because of their bad lives. Their irreverence and their impiety in the celebration of the holy mysteries because of their love of money for honor and for pleasures, 1846. The sins of consecrated persons. Now, it's not just priests. What are consecrated persons? Some priests, yes, but also nuns. The sins of consecrated persons cry out to heaven and bring down vengeance now. Vengeance is at their doors because no one can be found to implore mercy and pardon for the people. There are now no generous souls, no one worthy to offer the spotless victim to the all-eternal for the good of the world. Close quote. 1846, Our Lady Good Success, Quito, quote. The sacred sacrament of holy orders, now this is for the 20th century. The sacred sacrament of holy orders will be ridiculed. Oppressed and despised, for in so doing, one scorns and defiles the church of God and even God himself. Represented by the priests. The demon will try to persecute the ministers of the Lord in every possible way, and he will labor with cruel and subtle astuteness to deviate them from the spirit of their vocation. Corrupting many of them, these corrupted priests who will thus scandalize the Christian people. Read your paper lately. Scandalize the Christian people will incite the hatred of the bad Christians and the enemies of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church to fall upon all the priests. This apparent triumph of Satan will bring enormous suffering to the good pastors of the church, to the great majority of good priests, and to the supreme pastor and vicar of Christ on earth, suppose who will shed secret and bitter tears in the presence of his God and Lord, beseeching light, sanctity, and perfection for all the clergy of the world, of which he is the King and the Father. Close quote. You don't want to hear what I have to say. You want to hear what Our Lady has to say. So what does all of that lead us up to? It leads us up to this. 
Whenever the passion of the church is beginning to be expressed in a more and more intense way, then nine times out of ten there's a betrayal going on. And that betrayal often centers around the holy sacrifice of the Mass and the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in the most blessed sacrament. It's scriptural. Recently, one of the more prominent shepherds of the church who saw firsthand the liturgical disaster, as this has come about in the last 40 years, he's come forward in his old age and stated the truth. Cardinal Virgilio Noe, he was for years in the Vatican. He was a former papal MC, involved with the liturgy in the Vatican, by no means a traditionalist. But he has stated that he himself knows what that much argued about statement by Pope Paul VI, made in the 1970s about the smoke of Satan entering the sanctuary of the church actually meant. Cardinal Noe has said that he knows what that statement means. And many of you have read it in book after book after book. Pope Paul VI has been quoted many times. Pope Paul VI said publicly, the smoke of Satan has entered the sanctuary of the church. And these preachers would get up and preach about that smoke of Satan and so on and so forth. But when they'd comment on it, they could only give their best guess about what it meant because they didn't know. Cardinal Noe says he knows. And you can read this yourself. Website, Petrus. Petrus website. And it's also on the What Does the Prayer Really Say website. Go and look it up yourself. Interview with Cardinal Noe. Quote, this is what it says. He was the MC at the Vatican. Pope Paul VI's denunciation of the presence of the smoke of Satan in the church is unforgettable. Still today, that discourse seems to be incredibly relevant. That's the uh, interviewer giving the question, and this is what the cardinal said. You from Petrus have gotten a real scoop here because I'm in a position to reveal for the first time what Paul VI desired to denounce with that statement. Smoke of Satan had entered the church. Here it is. Pope Montini, for Satan meant to include all those priests or bishops and cardinals who didn't render worship to the Lord by celebrating badly Holy Mass because of a wrong interpretation of the implementation of the Second Vatican Council. He spoke of the smoke of Satan because he maintained that those priests who turned Holy Mass into dry straw in the name of creativity in reality were possessed of the vainglory and pride of the evil one. So the smoke of Satan was nothing other than the mentality which wanted to distort the traditional and liturgical canons of the Eucharistic ceremony. And he concluded the interview with this, because he was not a traditionalist at the time, but he's getting old now, and he concluded it this way. Now it is necessary to recover and in a hurry the sense of the sacred before the smoke of Satan completely pervades the whole church. He gave this interview last year. Thanks be to God, we have Pope Benedict XVI. His mass and his liturgical style are an example of correctness and dignity. Close quote. He gave that last year. And that quote from Smoke of Satan goes back 30 years. So why are people like Cardinal Noe finally telling us the truth? Because Pope Benedict has finally cleared the way, thanks be to God. But none of this is new, not one bit of it that he's doing. None of it is new. Anybody that was a seminarian that read Cardinal Ratzinger's work knew he was talking about this 15 years ago. Not anything new. He made it perfectly clear in his books over and over again that as a young priest, he, Cardinal Ratzinger, was dismayed. By the so-called liturgical renewal, he was upfront about it. He told everybody that wanted to hear. He wrote book after book. But before he retired, he decided to write his memoirs, his autobiography called Milestones. Ignatius Press puts it out. I recommend it. And it is available to everyone from Ignatius Press. And much of it's on the net. There's people that they get it right off the book and put it on the net. But listen to this. And remember, when he wrote this, His memoirs, he thought he was just going to quit being a cardinal and go into retirement. That's what he thought he was going to. 
but he became Pope. And he didn't know he was going to be Pope when he wrote this. So this is what he wrote. You can go get the book Milestones and read it yourself. I'll only give the key quotes. This is from his autobiography before he became Pope and didn't know he was going to be Pope. Quote, The second great event at the beginning of my years in Regensburg was the publication in the Missal of Pope Paul VI. That's the new mass. Which was accompanied by the almost total prohibition of using the Missal we had until then. But I was dismayed by the prohibition of the old missile, since nothing of the sort had ever happened in the entire history of the liturgy. He's publicly writing these things. Quote, The prohibition of the missile that was now decreed, a missile that had known continuous growth over the centuries, starting with the sacramentaries of the ancient church, that introduced a breach into the history of the liturgy whose consequences could only be tragic. It was reasonable and right of the council to order revision of the missile, such as often take place, something small. But more than this now happened, the old building was demolished, and another was built, to be sure, largely using materials from the previous one and even the old floor plans, setting it as a new construction over against what had grown historically, forbidding the results of that historical growth. This has caused enormous harm. For then the impression had to emerge that the liturgy is something we can make to be made, not something given in advance by God, but something lying within our own power of decision. And this is how he ended that particular part. You ought to read the whole part. I am convinced that the the crisis, I am convinced that the crisis in the church that we are experiencing today is to a large extent due to the disintegration of the liturgy. Let's repeat that. I am convinced that the crisis in the church that we are experiencing today is to a large extent due to the disintegration of the liturgy. Close quote. So even as a young priest... The Pope says he was dismayed. He's been public about it all along. And he publicly said so. But if you were a priest or a seminarian at the time when he wrote this, may the Lord help you. If anybody ever let you utter such words yourself, even though it was common knowledge. And even today in some circles... Even if I just attempt to quote the cardinal, it depends on where you are. Even if I just attempt to quote the 15-year-old words of the cardinal, the priests and the people and the nuns often just turn it off and go into denial. That's what a dysfunctional family is. They go into denial. So my dear brothers and sisters in Christ... You here you have been given a precious gift by Almighty God. Don't take it for granted. You have a forum here where these things can be freely discussed. Cherish the gift. Don't take it for granted. Everything is definitely not okay yet generally in the church. You still have a massive number of priests, nuns, and laity that are simply clueless about these things. We have to be charitable with it. And one of the reasons is that all of the things that Cardinal Ratzinger wrote about over the years, and I read them, we collected all of his books as they came out. We were reading them. Some of the people that were over us didn't want us to read them. Everything that he came out with was systematically covered up from the people. In other words, everything he's saying now has been out public for 15 years. But your average Catholic didn't get a chance to hear it. Systematically covered up and misrepresented and denied. They spread rumors about him. They said that he was the Rottweiler from Germany and so on and so forth. Painting him bad in the picture of the people. Why? Because many of the priests and nuns and laity had already been systematically re-educated and brainwashed. 
and confused. They had already thrown away all the things that you need for the traditional mass. The missiles, the vestments, the chalices, the altar cards. You cannot have that mass without those things. And they filled up the dumpsters with them, as you recall. And now that this is swinging around the other way, pride often takes hold. Pride now. Such that if some reintroduction of the Tridentine Mass is to be done, it would mean somebody would have to make an act of humility and admit that mistakes had been made, but those are dangerous waters. Mistakes? Humility? Admit that I might have been wrong or hasty about this or that. Admit that I might have been told to do something that was not correct and I did it anyway. And now I need to make some sort of restitution. For many Catholic people today, they will just say, no, forget it. I won't do that. Because of pride. Yet if that is the attitude of some, then it's just too bad. Because that is not in any way the attitude of our Pope or any of his representatives. And these things have been squashed too. He's got his representatives going out trying to spread the word. And often the people don't get to hear what they have to say either. Now Archbishop Ranjish, the one from India, he's one of the ones that's gone on and tried to get this motu proprio put into effect. And this is what he said. Quote, this is the Pope's man. The motu proprio is the fruit of a deep reflection by our Pope on the mission of the church. It's not up to us who wear ecclesiastical purple to draw this into question, to be disobedient, to make the motu proprio void by our own little rules. What the Holy Father says has to be obeyed in the church. If we do not follow this principle, we will allow ourselves to be used as instruments of the devil. This will lead to discord in the church and slows down her mission. We do not have time to waste on this, he said, or we'll behave like the Emperor Nero fiddling on his violin while Rome was burning. The churches are empty, there are no vocations, the seminaries are empty, priests are becoming older and older, and the young priests are scarce. Close quote. Now, of course, that's not true in, in traditional communities because the vocations are there. And the archbishop realizes that, and that's why he wants to get this traditional mass going so the vocations can come back. Cardinal Hoyas, familiar with him? He was over the liturgy. He went to London, and it was the first traditional mass in West, I think it was Westminster Cathedral in 30 or 40 years, and he ordained some men in there. And that London newspaper is called The Telegraph, and so this guy comes over from The Telegraph, and he's going to ask Cardinal Hoyas some questions about traditional mass. So this is what the guy said. Your Eminence, would the Holy Father like to see, you know, some Parishes here and there, ordinary parishes in England and Wales introduced the traditional mass here and there. The cardinal answered, not many parishes, all parishes. All parishes, not many, all parishes, because this is a gift of God. He offers these riches, and it is very important for the new generation and other pastors of the church. This kind of worship is noble, beautiful, the deepest theological way to express our faith. The worship, the music, the architecture, the painting makes it a whole treasure. The Holy Father offers this to all the people. The Holy Father offers to all the people this possibility, not only the groups who demand it. But so that everybody knows this way of celebrating the Eucharist in the Catholic Church. You see what they're trying to say? Now, we all know that our Holy Father, Pope Benedict, is trying desperately to remedy some of these things. God bless him. So he needs our help. You need an apostolate? 
prayer support. Moral support. Like you're doing. Doing the things he is asking us to do. It is the mass that matters. So what is the lesson here, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ? Almighty God, Jesus Christ himself will not be outdone in generosity. If you expend the time to faithfully attend and to continue to support, to pray at and to pray for the traditional mass and the priests that you have here at the traditional mass, and see that your family is habitually exposed to this traditional mass, you will reap only good fruit. And don't tell me it's not an apostolate if you have to load up six, seven, eight, nine, ten children in a gigantic van on Sunday and drive 50 miles. Don't tell me it's not an apostolate. It is the most important apostolate in the church today, period, next to the suffering apostolate we talked about last night. The mass is what matters. If your personal apostle is to help maintain the traditional mass, you have the best personal apostle in the church. That apostolate has the power to form saints. And whenever priests like, whenever a priest comes in here, hasn't been here for a while, or has he's looking at the people and says, it's a little bit different here. There's something a little bit different here. Something going on around here. Must be some supernatural grace around here somewhere. This apostolate has the power to form saints. You will, however, often be opposed. Because supporting Christ and his mystical sacrifice, his passion, mystically applied through time in the Mass, if you support our Lord in this, then the opponents to the cross are going to pop up all the time, and they're always going to oppose it, sometimes even in their own families. So what else is new? What else is new in the church? So I want to conclude this conference then with something good. A true story. The story of one of my very favorite saints. She's a housewife from England. Wife and a mother. One of the most glorious saints in the list of those who supported, lived out and sacrificed themselves totally for our Lord Jesus Christ and his traditional mass and the holy priesthood. Her name was Margaret, very attractive, cheerful, intelligent, dedicated, wife, mother, and Catholic, university loved by all. Everybody loved Margaret. She had married a butcher in York, England, right after the time of Henry VIII, at the time of the apostate Queen Elizabeth. Her husband, John Clitheroe, the butcher, and she was known as Mistress Margaret Clitheroe. Lived at the time, immediately following the break. Schism from Rome. Remember Henry VIII split from Rome. He claimed that it was really the king and queen of England who were the true heads of the church in that country, not the pope. And that's quite serious because our Lord said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he could have said, he could have added our Lord there, whoever loves their country and their king and their queen. The unjust laws of their country more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves their reputation and their standing in the community more than me is not worthy of me. And so St. Margaret Clitheroe took the good Lord at his word. She put Jesus Christ in her Catholic face first. And she never wavered. And she was put to the test. She was wonderful, cheerful, attractive young married woman. But she was raised Protestant, and her intuition told her that that wasn't the truth. This is from Butler's quote. Margaret was bred a Protestant, but two or three years after her marriage, she embraced the Catholic faith. When she had been led to study, finding no substance, truth, nor Christian comfort in the ministers of that new gospel, nor in their doctrine itself, and hearing also that many priests and lay people were suffering in defense of the ancient Catholic faith. So she was one of the Protestants at the time, and she heard about these Catholics that were suffering. And she said, what's that all about? So she looked into it. And then when she became a Catholic, she and the holy women would go out at midnight to the places of martyrdom where the martyrs had died for their faith, and they would go and pray at those places. 
and collect the relics of the saints. She'd stay on her knees until dawn. But Margaret did convert to the Catholic Church. Now, for us, that doesn't seem such a big deal. But in England at that time, it was dangerous. Dangerous proposition because it was against the law. The Catholic faith was outlawed. The king, you see, wanted all the people in his new religion. None of the people in the other one. No exceptions. So our little housewife saint, who was determined to practice her Catholic faith, she became an outlaw. You might say she was on a spiritual wanted poster. An outlaw. Simply because she was a Catholic. She was subject to fines, harsh imprisonment, and if she was caught hiding a priest, she was subject to the death penalty. But when Margaret converted, one of her good spiritual directors was one of those secret priests in England. They'd secretly go from place to place. Faith was outlawed, and so the priest had to go around in secret. And so they'd get their cassock, you know, and put it in a brown paper bag and wear lay clothes around. And so they go from house to house, and they they made those little secret hiding places in those manor houses. You can still see them today. Some of you may have even been there and seen them. And they were very difficult for those wicked men that were looking for them to find those hiding holes because the person that made the hiding holes was a saint. He was a saint carpenter, St. Nicholas Owen. And he made these hiding places. But St. Margaret got one of those hiding places for her house with a Catholic altar in it. Quote, this from Butler's. In order that none should be deprived of Mass when it could be had, her spiritual director tells us she had prepared two chambers, the one adjoining to her own house that she might have resort to at any time without sight and knowledge of her neighbors because they were spying on her. The other was a little distant from her own house and it was secret, unknown to any but such as she knew to be both faithful and discreet. She was an outlaw. So even though at that time the law and the land was opposed to the Catholic faith and the Catholic math, St. Margaret understood that no law has any force which attempts to do away with any part of the true religion of our Lord Jesus Christ or his mass. She put it so well. Whenever she was arrested, they, they asked her some questions and they, they asked her if she was guilty or not. And she said, I know of no offense whereof I should confess myself guilty. I've done nothing wrong. Having made no offense, she had told them, I need no trial. Because she was innocent. But the arrest of St. Margaret came, however, when they began to spy on her. That was the name of the game in England at that time. And it's always been full of spies. And if you've ever lived in a small town, she lived in York. You ever lived in a small town? There's always somebody peeking out to win that. You see what you're doing. So they were spying on her to see. They knew she was a Catholic and that she was attractive and pleasant and good. And so they wanted to see what she was all about. So they watched her. So one day they saw a man go into the, her place who was not dressed as a priest, but as they say, he sure looked like one. man's not dressed like a priest. I bet that guy's a priest going to see St. Margaret Clithero. She's a cat. So they sounded the alarm, and they called on the authorities, rushed into that secret hiding place for priests. Priests barely got away. But they found there what? Vestments, a missile, challenge, everything for mass. Here's the quote from her biography. On March 12, 1586, while Margaret was busy with her household, two sheriffs of the city entered the Clithero house. Nothing suspicious was found at first, but on opening the door to a remote room, the men found some children of the neighborhood who were being taught by a schoolmaster, whom they mistook for a priest. In the confusion that developed, he escaped to the secret room. Another account tells that Margaret's confessor and Father Ingleby were also in the house at that time, but if so, they too escaped. An 11-year-old boy who was then living with the family, they terrorized him interrogated him into revealing where the secret hiding place was. No one was found there, but the authorities found chalices, books, and vestments that had been used during Holy Mass and taken as evidence, and Margaret was arrested. Can you imagine? 
And so St. Margaret Clithero was arrested and thrown into prison because she had hidden Catholic priests in her house and had attended Mass there. When the judge asked her what sort of trial she thought that she should have, she said that since she hadn't done anything wrong, she didn't need a trial at all. And you can imagine that they weren't very happy about that. Because recall the type of men that she was up against here, men who were who would call in little children and accuse them before their mother. Apostates, pitiless, degenerate types. But despite all this, the astounding thing was that our saint remained so cheerful. She could have saved herself very easily. All she had to do was to renounce her Catholic faith. That's what they told her. They said, look, all you got to do is renounce your Catholic faith. Give it up. We'll let you go free. That was out of the question. So when she heard the kind of execution that they condemned her to undergo, she said, God be thanked. All that he shall send me is welcome. I'm not worthy to die so good a death as this. You see, she was condemned to be pressed to death, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But when she reached the place of execution, the apostates wanted to pray together with her, but she declined. Why? Because it was precisely because she rejected that new religion that she was undergoing the death penalty in the first place. So she would not make common cause with them. Especially not on the day of her martyrdom. She was a woman of principle. This is from Butler's Lives of the Saints, quote. She was to suffer on March 25th, which was Friday in Passion Week. Arriving at the place of execution, she knelt down to pray, and some of those present desired to join her in prayer. She refused. I will not pray with you. Nor shall you pray with me, she said. Neither will I say amen to your prayer, nor shall you say amen to mine. But she prayed aloud for the Pope, cardinals, clergy, Christian princes, and especially for Queen Elizabeth, that God would turn her to the faith and save her soul, close quote. Isn't that what a Catholic is supposed to do? bring other people into the Roman Catholic Church. So Margaret Clitheroe is one of the most courageous. Even men often wouldn't do such things. She's one of the most courageous, heroic, and glorious martyrs for the Catholic Mass. And her profession of faith before she died, you can't match this profession of faith that she gave before she died. Quote, I am, she said, fully resolved in all things touching my faith which I ground upon Jesus Christ, and by him I steadfastly believed to be saved, which faith I acknowledged to be the same that he left to his apostles and they to their successors from time to time, the bishops, and is taught in the Catholic Church through all Christendom and promised to remain with her unto the world's end, and heaven's gates shall not prevail against it, and by God's assistance I mean to live and die in the same faith, For if an angel come from heaven and preach any other doctrine than we have received, the apostle bids us not to believe him, close quote. That's the most magnificent profession of faith I've ever read. St. Margaret Clitheroe. And so as we say, she was then condemned to be pressed to death. What's that? I thought these people were civilized. She was condemned to be pressed to death. That's when they make you lie down on the ground and put a sharp rock under the small of your back. And they tie your hands to some post on each side. And then they put one of those heavy oaken English doors on top of you. And then they begin to pile heavy rocks and stones on top of that door of 100 weight each. Up to seven or 800 pounds. So it's 100, 200, 300, 400. 500, all the way up to seven or 800 pounds, and it's extremely painful. It takes time, maybe 15 minutes or more to die. So here is the account of her martyrdom from Butler's quote. At eight in the morning, the sheriff came to conduct her to the toll booth. All marveled to see her joyful, smiling countenance. 
Arrived at the place of execution, she knelt down to pray. She prayed aloud for the Pope, cardinals, clergy, Christian princes, especially for Queen Elizabeth, that God would turn her to the faith and save her soul. She was then obliged to lie flat on the ground with a sharp stone under her back, and her hands were bound to the post at the side. A door was laid over her and weights placed upon it to the quantity of seven or eight hundred pounds. Her last words as they descended upon her were, Jesu, 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 have mercy on me. She was about a quarter of an hour in dying, but her body was left for six hours in that press. At the time of her death, she was something about 30 years old. And so died St. Margaret Clitheroe. Her last words are so sweet and haunting. Jesus, 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 have mercy on me. But her holy soul went directly to Christ because she was a martyr and she shed her blood for Jesus and she died also for the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And so we're going to conclude now with her last will and testament. She made a last will and testament. And to her husband, she said, she gives her hat. She gave her hat to her husband. Why did she give her hat to her husband? She gave her hat to her husband because she knew that the wife is the heart of the family and the husband is the head. (laughs) So she left her hat to her husband. And to her 12-year-old daughter, Agnes, she left her shoes and her stockings. Why did she leave her shoes and her stockings to the little 12-year-old Agnes? so that Agnes would follow in her footsteps. And Agnes did follow in her footsteps because when that little 12-year-old girl grew up, she later became a contemplative nun on the continent at Louvain in Belgium. That's not all. St. Margaret Clitheroe had two sons who later became Roman Catholic missionary priests on the continent. A Douay, ordained, so that when they were ordained to the priesthood, they could bring the faith back to England again. We thank you, Lord, for these small gifts and graces that we have received from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. And may the souls of the faithful depart into the mercy of God. Don't be a little bit. Maybe that also.